their, their Secretary of State for European Affairs. Thank you very much for being here today and uh, giving uh, honor uh, to uh, our uh, initiative, uh, which the Portuguese Republic has been so uh, uh, supportive to the uh, European Public Law Organization and uh, the Global Rule of Law Initiative uh, and the Global Rule of Law Commission. Uh, dear friend and other Secretary General and Legal Counsel of uh, the United Nations, uh, thank you very much uh, also for being here to address the, this uh, meeting. You have always been very supportive uh, to uh, the uh, EPLO initiatives. And uh, dear Professor Servo Correa, uh, Professor Servo Correa is the president of the uh, uh, Scientific Council of our branch uh, in uh, Cascais. Ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur le Président, uh, friends, professors, representatives of uh, foreign powers, the uh, uh, meeting today is starting with uh, something which uh, happened yesterday evening. Yesterday evening, I received uh, a communication, telephone call from uh, Minister uh, Jumar Mendes, Minister Jumar Mendes is the Dean of the Supreme Court of Brazil, who um, wanted bitterly to um, inform uh, that uh, he would uh, and he should fly back uh, to Brazil, and so he did yesterday evening, in order to uh, be um, um, in uh, the country uh, to face uh, the... Um, uh, unfortunate events uh, which uh, democracy and the rule of law uh, are suffering uh, in um, uh, his uh, country. And uh, we all wish uh, to him uh, uh, good uh, luck for uh, the development of the institutions of uh, his country. And this uh, is a very bitter way uh, to see how um, how justified uh, this initiative uh, which uh, we are taking today uh, is. Because uh, uh, the rule of law uh, is or may be at threat in any country independently uh, of uh, the level of the development of the institutions. On uh, October 10, 2022, uh, the legal advisor of uh, uh, the uh, permanent uh, uh, mission of uh, the EPLO to the United Nations uh, in our capacity as permanent observer uh, to the General Assembly uh, made a, an announcement, an intervention to the proceedings of the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly dealing with the issue as they do every year on the issue of the rule of law. His uh, uh, announcement reads as follows. The European Public Law Organization, EPLO, international organization of global character, having the status of permanent observer to the General Assembly of the United Nations, has the honor to present to the attention of the Sixth Commission the initiative herein proposed in the area of the rule of law. The aim is to contribute to the national and international level for the development of the understanding of the rule of law and for a better world pursuant to the universal values of the United Nations. Having among its aims the promotion of public law and governance worldwide 
in an environment of mutual understanding and dialogue of civilizations, especially in cooperation with the United Nations system, EPLO, in the footsteps of its global rule of law initiative that was launched in a special event in November 2019 with uh, the sponsorship of several countries from all continents in the United Nations, has established a Global Rule of Law Commission. The Global Rule of Law Commission shall be composed of 19 personalities from all over the world, according to the principle of geographical representation. The members appointed by the APLO are as follows, six from the Western European and others group, two from the Eastern European group, three from the Asian group, four from the African group, three from Latin and Central America and the Pacific, and in principle, no two of the members may be of the same nationality. Their office is honorary and discretionary. The Global Rule of Law Commission shall have the objective to develop a comprehensive global concept of the rule of law with respect to the UN universal values and diversity. The Global Rule of Law Commission shall be available to all the nations of the world. The Global Rule of Law Commission shall be open to receive information from all nations. It would also be a forum to make studies, proposals, resolutions, and other working papers in coordination with the UN system and the global focal point for the rule of law. The Global Rule of Law Commission members shall not have political considerations in pursuing the execution of their duties and shall not have sanction powers of any kind. The Global Rule of Law Commission shall operate from the EPLO headquarters in Cascais, Portugal, and shall do everything to serve the United Nations initiatives for a better world. To this end, an annual report shall be presented yearly to the General Assembly. The EPLO, having among its constitutive elements the respect of all cultures, appeals to all delegates of the Sixth Committee and asks for support and suggestions. The EPLO takes also this opportunity, and I'm taking also this opportunity today because many representatives of uh, foreign powers are here, to ask the missions to the UN to propose one person per country to act as a focal point, representative and liaison officer of the Global Rule of Law Initiative proposed by EPLO. Dear Secretary of State for uh, European Affairs, uh, dear members of our uh, meeting uh, today, the PLO is very proud of uh, being able to start the official work uh, of the EPLO branch in Portugal, which so generously the Portuguese Republic permitted and supported to uh, be organized and uh, to be able to start today uh, its public uh, appearance and public uh, uh, spirited uh, work. As for the members of the Commission, uh, the EPLO is very proud that uh, you have accepted to be part of it. We know very well how important every one of you uh, is for your country, for your region, and uh, for the world. And we kindly ask you to uh, help the EPLO in its capacity as permanent observer to the United Nations 
to be useful to the leading organization of the world. Because this is our house, that's where we have put all our hopes for a better world where all mankind will develop together and uh, proportionally. Thank you very much. And Your Excellency, please accept to come to the floor. Good morning, dear Professor Flogaitis, dear Undersecretary General for Legal Affairs, dear Professor Servo Kuraya, distinguished members of the Global Rule of Law Commission, distinguished uh, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is first and foremost, let me just start by saying it is a pleasure for me personally to be here today at this event that marks the launch of this uh, initiative. And uh, I want to thank Professor Flogaitis for his invitation and for the uh, opportunity to be here and address this um, very qualified audience and, um, and say, just having the opportunity to, to share with you some opening remarks on the work of this um, uh, Global uh, Rule of Law uh, Commission. I want to praise the EPLO for this initiative of setting up this uh, um, commission. And I want to wish all the best and all the success um, for this new body and for all its members, since you have a very important, very necessary, and at the same time, very difficult task ahead of you. Because, of course, the rule of law is not just one thing. It is a set of very different things combined. It is obviously about democracy, but it goes well beyond it. And even when we consider democracy, in itself, it's a set of things. It's about free and fair elections, of course, but it's about separation of powers and having a good system, uh, a strong system of checks and balances. Uh, it's about media freedom and media plurality. And it's about not just having a free media, but having a free society. Um, and then rule of law also entails um, respect for minorities and even, in some cases, affirmative action for those uh, which come from a disadvantaged starting point. Um, avoiding oppression. This is the uh, famous freedom from fear that uh, Roosevelt mentioned. Um, civil rights, of course, but also social rights. <coughs> the freedom from want. Uh, because if people don't have their basic needs satisfied, they are not uh, never uh, completely free. Um, it's about the primacy of law or the principle of legality. And it's about the principle of equality. Um, and it's about judicial independence and judicial efficiency in order to ensure the enforcement of all of the above, basically. Um, so it's... it's uh, uh, a lot of things that need to come into place and um, together they form this concept of the rule of law. Um, this is just very basic uh, reasoning. Then it's your task uh, to do this in technical and very, um, um, with your expertise, to set this uh, concept and standards of the rule of law. But the rule of law, although it's, it's a mixture of different things, um, it's also not a done deal. It's uh, because it's forever, rule of law standards are forever evolving. And um, obviously there are new challenges um, coming. Uh, obviously when, um, before there was internet and after the internet, um, there, these are two worlds and uh, there are new challenges with the digital transition that we are undergoing, new challenges every day to uh, fundamental rights uh, that are posed and uh, artificial intelligence creates new challenges that need to be addressed. Um, other developments in science, in genetics, etc. Um, and even things like to talk, talking about more day-to-day um, -day things that we've all um, witnessed and had to endure. The pandemic obviously brought with it a lot of challenges to the rule of law. 
because all of a sudden, basic freedoms that we took for granted were being challenged by a virus that nobody knew. And, um, and, the, and this created a, a very uh, difficult situation in which we had to um, fight this virus, and, um, but at the same time, try to uh, respect to the um, biggest amount possible um, the rules and the freedoms and the set of uh, principles that we um, are used to in our societies. And this was a, quite a challenge to combine and to have this, um, to be able to fight this virus while being able to uh, maintain uh, rule of law standards. And beyond the standards that are forever evolving, obviously the level of implementation and enforcement also varies a lot in time and in space. And all it takes is really one election in which um, citizens decide to, um, they are fed up with the same old solutions, the same old talk by um, um, the establishment and decide to innovate and go for a different kind of candidate that says out of the box <coughs> things. And then all of a sudden, you see that rule of law standards start being eroded. And, um, and what we were used to then um, starts um, fading away. Um, so this uh, goes to my final and most important point, which is the rule of law is not a given, and we should never, ever take it for granted. Because as we've sadly, and Professor already mentioned this, as we've sadly witnessed two days ago in Brazil, um, the institutions that we show so much cherish, the institutions that are the very core, the basic foundations of democracy, they can be in peril from one day to the other. And in this case, all it takes is a bomb to invade these institutions and to actually to stage an attack on the very basic democratic institutions that we so much cherish. And, um, and it might seem a circle, but the best remedy against these attacks on institutions is to have solid institutions. Um, it's because the United States have solid institutions that they were able to overcome a similar action two years ago well, with the attack on Congress. And it's... Um, and this also goes to my point that we should never take democracy for granted and the rule of law for granted, because even in the United States, um, even in a deep-rooted, sophisticated democracy, regarded as a beacon of the rule of law in many aspects, not in all of them, but in many, and it's uh, with a system of governance, uh, of government crafted by the founding fathers, um, genius that... Um, got together in Philadelphia and, and just um, drafted this constitution, which is still today regarded as a, a piece of art. And um, so even in this country, even the, in the American democracy, something like this, an attack on the basic institutions was um, possible. So the risk is there. And this reminds me of a quote of Benjamin Franklin, precisely in the uh, Constitutional Convention when they, uh, in Philadelphia, um, the day um, they reached an agreement and all the members of the Constitutional Convention back in 18, uh, 1787, they were signing the US Constitution. Uh, Franklin is um, uh, said to have said that um, he was, uh, for all this time, uh, that the convention, the Constitutional Convention took place at the Independence Hall, he was always staring at the chair in which George Washington sat. And this chair had a sun carved on the chair. There was a sun. And he said at the last day of the convention, when they were signing the Constitution, for all this time I have been staring at this sun, trying to determine whether it is a rising or a setting sun. And I now know it is a rising sun. And this, although it, this is a message of hope and uh, expectation, optimism regarding the US Constitution and the fact that they had reached an agreement on a system of governance with checks and balances that they were hopeful of what that would bring, this also reminds us of how dangerously similar a rising 
and a setting sun look like. And so what we regard as a rising sun can all of a sudden, from one day to the other, just become a setting sun. And this is my uh, warning. And, um, and also in Europe, I've talked about Brazil and about the United States. Also in Europe, we have this, uh, which is also usually considered a sanctuary of the rule of law. We also have our challenges. Um, but we also have a set of tools and mechanisms. So we have a rule of law toolbox, uh, which is still in development. It's still being improved as we go along. But we already have a set of remedies or instruments. Um, we have Article 7 in the Treaty of the European Union, uh, which um, provides for uh, sanctions to be applied in case there is a breach of the rule of law. It's difficult to apply it, as um, um, the majority demands for that are difficult to attain. But it exists, and it is important to have it there and to keep it as an instrument of leverage uh, for um, the rule of law to be uh, observed by all member states at all time. Then we have the Commission um, has, um, for three years, I guess three years now, um, has issued an annual report on the rule of law for each member state. So it analyzes uh, the rule of law and how it is being complied with in each member state. And now it issues recommendations for each member state in order to improve its level of compliance. And based on that report, we have at the General Affairs Council of the European Union, where I sit every month, we have a meeting. Almost every month on the agenda, we have a, uh, a point on the rule of law because we have these constant dialogues, an horizontal di an annual horizontal dialogue on the rule of law based on the report by the European Commission. And then we have a um, specific dialogue, member state by member state, in which all the member states are invited to um, analyze and go in depth into the situation of the rule of law in each member state. This is not a punitive procedure. It is based on an exchange of good practices and an exchange of views on how each member state goes about dealing with rule of law issues. Uh, so Portugal was under analysis at the um, last meeting in December of the General Affairs Council. And it's uh, a very important exercise in which um, between partners, we uh, share experiences and good practices and try to learn with each other on how to perfection our rule of law systems. And then we have a more recent mechanism, a conditionality mechanism, which allows for the suspension of European funds in case there is a breach of the rule of law. This has been applied for the first time in relation to Hungary, and this has led to some um, development in the Hungarian judicial system to occur. So this is a positive development. So we have a toolbox. It's not perfect, but we have it. It's there. And what I think is important is that we also develop a toolbox for the rule of law at the global scale. And this is where the work of the um, Global Rule of Law Commission comes into play. Um, so I think this is a very important uh, initiative. Um, to set up a concept or standards of rule of law at a global scale. It's more difficult to do it than at the European level, of course, because the situation is more diverse. Um, also to provide counsel and guidance on states, on NGOs, on uh, an institution uh, on rule of law issues, and to promote the very idea of the rule of law and its institutions. So that we might all um, see that the sun is indeed rising, not setting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the Secretary of State for European Affairs, for your inspiring uh, intervention. And uh, actually, uh, we had an excellent uh, proof of uh, how important it is for politics to uh, absorb people from the university. <laughs> uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the EPLO, according to, uh, the, um, to its statute, um, is asked by the uh, countries which have uh, created it uh, to uh, 
to uh, uh, work closely with uh, other international organizations and especially the international organizations of the United Nations system. And um, it was thanks to Portugal uh, that this uh, was uh, uh, possible. And uh, uh, I remember that it was uh, in 2019 uh, when I was uh, uh, introduced by Portugal, by the president of this country, uh, to uh, the Secretary uh, General of uh, the United Nations. And uh, uh, after that um, uh, official uh, visit uh, to the headquarters of the United Nations in uh, New York, uh, we started the procedure uh, to uh, ask uh, the General Assembly uh, to uh, accept uh, the EPLO as permanent observers. Uh, it is needless to say, because the most of you uh, come from the diplomatic world, uh, that this is not uh, a, a very easy procedure because it needs uh, um, countries to propose you and uh, officially, and then uh, uh, two uh, uh, votations in uh, the sixth committee and one third uh, in uh, the General Assembly, which means that uh, uh, there is a big risk of having a country among the almost 200 uh, countries of the world uh, opposing uh, for this or other reason um, uh, the uh, proposal. We are thankful to Portugal, dear um, uh, minister, uh, because it was Portugal uh, which took the initiative to propose us. And of course, we are thankful to 16 more countries which um, came uh, to um, align themselves to your proposal. But it was Portugal's uh, proposal. And we will never uh, forget that. And uh, so today, uh, the EPLO uh, works uh, uh, very uh, as much as we can, hand in hand, uh, by following uh, the, the developments in the United Nations system. One of the persons who has always uh, the door open uh, to uh, uh, the EPLO is, uh, coincidence, Portuguese. Uh, uh, the Under Secretary uh, uh, General and Legal Counsel, um, Miguel de Serpa Suarez. Uh, we are thankful uh, to him because he has always been very attentive uh, to uh, hear about uh, how we developed and what we do to exchange opinions, to consult, to advise us. And uh, we are also very um, thankful because he has been there uh, in um, uh, room seven of the United Nations a few uh, months ago uh, to address uh, the presentation which we made there uh, of the Global Rule of Law Commission. Dear uh, Secretary Gen Under Secretary General and Legal Counsel, uh, my good friend uh, Miguel, uh, have the floor. Secretary of State, President Amato on the screen. I'm very sorry you're not with us today. Professor Foygaitis, my dear friend, Spiridon, and all the distinguished members of the Global Rule of Law Commission. Thank you for inviting me for this inaugural meeting. As you said, incidentally, I'm Portuguese, so it's always uh, good to have a, an excuse to come home. Um, and um, I closely follow, as you mentioned, the developments of the rule of law projects of APLO since the 2019 launch of its global uh, rule of law initiative. I have participated also in the 2022 um, side events that you have organized in the United Nations headquarters in New York. And I'm very pleased to note that um, we do have a good partnership uh, and I look forward to our cooperation in the future. 
Now, unfortunately, and at least my previous speakers have mentioned, the international community is currently facing a somehow crisis of confidence in the global rule. Of course, myself as a Portuguese citizen, it's a sobering moment to watch on television just saw uh, in Brasilia that we have seen on TV. Unfortunately for me, as a resident in, uh, in the US, is a, somehow a deja vu because I've seen this in the sixth general with the assault of, of the Congress. And Secretary of State, you have mentioned, uh, don't take it for granted, is a never ending process, the process of building a rule of law international and nationally. But again, and because I work in the United Nations, I am an optimist by nature, otherwise I would have a different job. So this means that we probably need innovative approaches and somehow different initiatives, how to strengthen and promote the rule of law worldwide. So as a legal counsel of the United Nations, I am deeply committed to advancing the cause of justice and the rule of law at the international level. That's my jurisdiction. In the United Nations, we very much focus on building capacity, raising awareness, advocating for greater compliance with the rule of law. And we work together with member states and various stakeholders to address the new and existing challenges that plague the world. And this includes, of course, violent armed conflict, climate change and pollution, hunger and poverty, pandemic, widespread dangerous diseases, and so on. So we aim to find peaceful solutions to these conflicts and disasters with the help of the rule of law mechanisms and instruments. So these collective efforts of the United Nations and the international community benefit from the national, regional, and international rule of law initiatives that promote peace, justice, and accountability. The Global uh, Rule of Law Commission, as a new player in this field, will need to integrate into the network of existing stakeholders and further develop uh, its program goals. It is my hope that the Commission will introduce an ambitious agenda with a strong commitment to supporting those in need and the voices of women and youth. I suggest a practical approach to help the most vulnerable and provide for actionable advice. The United Nations has taken steps to strengthen its work in this area. So the future of the rule of law agenda in the United Nations is reflected in the Secretary General's report on our common agenda. And uh, this document sets a comprehensive approach to strengthen the implementation of the rule of law worldwide. It will support us in achieving such important global targets as the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Our common agenda built a foundation for a new practical tool, a new vision for the rule of law, that's the title, and this new vision will put the rule of law at the center of our work as the foundation for peace and security and set out the links between the rule of law human rights and development. So I believe that the ideas and messages of the Secretary General that are expressed in this policy document, our common agenda, and this new vision that I have just referred, will be inspirational and instrumental also for the Commission in building its future program of work. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear Under Secretary General and Legal Council, and uh, dear friend um, Miguel, uh, for your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before uh, we uh, pass the floor to the main uh, speaker of uh, our meeting today, uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to uh, uh, remember that. Uh, Nothing of what is happening today uh, could have been done without uh, this municipality, the municipality of Cascais. 
and uh, the important people who uh, are uh, at the direction of this municipality, especially the president, uh, Carlos Carreras. They uh, have always been generous to this uh, organization. They uh, have established, they have accepted to establish uh, the headquarters of the branch of the EPLO in uh, Portugal in this uh, iconic building uh, and uh, they have also uh, given us further uh, spaces in, uh, um, uh, in another building which is just behind uh, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, town hall. Uh, so uh, uh, we are grateful uh, to Portugal, we are grateful to the United Nations, but uh, last but not least, uh, we are grateful uh, to uh, the municipality of uh, Cascais. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, main speaker uh, for us uh, today, what is happening? We lost the main speaker. Yes, we lost uh, Professor uh, Image, and we are waiting for our colleague in Greece to, to send us the, the new link so uh, we can uh, hear Professor Julian. All right. Uh, the um, uh, uh, the, the, the heart of the Global Rural of Law Commission is its president, uh, Professor Giuliano Amato. Professor Giuliano Amato uh, is internationally known for uh, uh, its many uh, contributions to the development of uh, the national and international world. And uh, actually, uh, he is uh, specially linked to uh, Portugal, because he was the president of the so-called uh, uh, Lisbon Commission, uh, which uh, produced the, um, the Treaty of uh, Lisbon for, of the European uh, Union. But apart from that, uh, he has been uh, twice Prime Minister of Italy and uh, many times uh, um, uh, minister. One of the best, uh, well-known constitutional uh, prof uh, lawyers and professors in the world, and uh, he just uh, um, uh, left the ended the presidency uh, in of the human of the constitutional court of Italy, and uh, so he was uh, very kind to uh, accept to. Uh, uh, to, to uh, advance uh, this project and to, uh, um, uh, and to preside it. Uh, President Giuliano Amato is uh, one of the people who have uh, worked a lot uh, during the years to um, uh, bring uh, the APLO to what uh, it uh, is uh, today. But, uh, you know, the days are difficult for traveling, especially because of the various um, viruses which uh, circulate. And so uh, he did not travel. Uh, <clears throat> as you hear my voice, I, I was more courageous and, uh, and uh, I, I, I traveled. But anyway, uh, do we have Sorry, any news? Because it, uh, he understood the, uh, that. Anyway, Professor Giuliano uh, Amato uh, asked me that if anything happens, because it, mean, it, it, it means that in this office uh, the uh, connection is not uh, uh, is not good. Continue, uh, continue trying to, uh, uh, to to find him, and uh, he asked me to. Uh, uh, say a few words uh, and, uh, about what he intended to do, and I'm sorry to abuse uh, uh, um, this uh, podium uh, more, on the, more than I should. Uh, so please continue uh, trying. Dear members of the Commission, uh, the, um, it was at the end of uh, the 18th century 
and uh, the turn to the 19th century, that um, A.V. Dicey was uh, writing his book on the law of the Constitution. And um, there he uh, codified and introduced in the modern times the idea of the rule of law. He said that uh, the rule of law was uh, a very important principle of the British institutions, a very important contribution of the British institutions to the world. And uh, not only he uh, developed what he thought it was the content of the principle of the rule of law, but he also thought that the opportunity was given to him to praise his country in comparison to the country which, according to him, did not have a rule of law. And that country, we are at the turn of the 19th, to the 19th century, could not be other than France. France was the country which did not have the rule of law, a very characteristic of the British constitution. France was uh, the country of uh, the droit administratif. A.V. Dicey refused of translating droit administratif in English words because he thought it would be a danger to the purity of the, uh, uh, of the British uh, constitution to translate droit administratif into administrative law. Droit administratif was a threat for the rule of law and it is the uh, uh, condition of France while England was leading the world by introducing the principle of the rule of law. It is an interesting story, and I'm sure that uh, uh, all of you uh, know the various aspects uh, of that uh, story. Uh, because uh, thousands of pages have been written on those considerations, and thousands of pages have evolved after those uh, considerations up to the modern uh, days when we use, as I will say in a few, word, in a few uh, moments, uh, they use uh, the, uh, 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 the term of the rule of law as a generic uh, term more than as a very specific one. The rule of law for A.V. Dicey was very, very precise. And he said that the rule of law means that everybody, but everybody, must be subjected to the law. There is no one who is exempted from being subjected to the law. Second, this law, this law should be the same for everyone. You cannot have branches of law applying to the public institutions which are different from the branches of law which apply to the private persons. The law should be the one and the same for everyone. Thirdly, the law should be sanctioned by uh, courts and uh, a well-developed system of law <coughs> would need a well-developed system of courts. 
but uh, the courts should be the same no matter who is coming for adjudication before the courts. You cannot have different courts for the state and different courts for uh, the private institutions, for, for the private uh, 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 persons. This is the idea of, uh, uh, of uh, Dicey. And he said that this does not apply to France because uh, uh, France has a special body of laws which are called droit administratif. And this special body of laws is meant to uh, protect the uh, to protect the uh, uh, public institutions uh, from being subjected to the general rule of law, to the general legislation uh, as it was uh, foreseen for all the rest. And uh, he wrote many pages. It is interesting to uh, understand <coughs> that uh, at the birthday of the idea uh, for the general public of uh, the rule of law, there is already this, <coughs> this um, uh, idea of rejecting the system of another. May I have some water, please? the system of another as not being at the level of your own system. <clears throat> at the end of his career, A.V. Dicey had uh, understood that he was wrong when he uh, criticized the Dua Administrative. And uh, he uh, was wrong because he was writing of the droit administratif of 50 years ago in comparison to the time when he was writing his lines. And when the French made him the honor to translate his book in France, there he wrote a, an introduction to the book where he expresses how uh, sorry he was uh, for uh, the uh, uh, lines which had written uh, against uh, the Dua Administrative. Today, we are called to upon as commission. We are called to develop from scratch the concept of the rule of law and uh, see how we can make it useful uh, to the world. We are not the only ones who are in this direction. It is uh, obvious that there are many initiatives around the globe uh, who, uh, which uh, are leading to the same vision. But we hope that we can uh, contribute uh, to these uh, developments uh, as much as uh, uh, the high level of the composition of this uh, uh, co uh, committee, commission uh, can guarantee. It is true that uh, everybody today talks about the rule of law and uh, It is obvious that uh, Dicey gave his own uh, definition of the rule of law by describing what 
the rule of law was for his country in the given times, what he said is not true for uh, his country today. And uh, he was opposing another system which was not uh, exactly as he said in the times uh, when he was writing already. But this demonstrates that we need in our commission, we need to work with uh, respect to the various concepts of the rule of law, the various traditions, legal traditions or legal experiences of every nation in the world, of every region of the world where we come from, so that we can develop together an understanding of uh, the rule of law which could be useful and common as much as possible uh, in order at the same time or later apply this to specific cases uh, coming to our knowledge from the world. The uh, rule of law is today promoted not only by lawyers, but also by politicians. <coughs> uh, Alessia, can you pay attention to me? No, no. and uh, by social scientists. What we need is to develop, however, something specific. And uh, that's what we are called uh, to do. So, thank you for uh, uh, embarking in this uh, nice uh, uh, adventure. Dear Secretary of State, thank you very much uh, for being with us today and uh, uh, addressing uh, so um, uh, generously this uh, institution. Dear uh, Under Secretary General and uh, Legal Counsel of the United States, of the United uh, Nations. <laughs> of the it, it is always a problem to uh, 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 to, 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 uh, uh, to, to avoid to make this uh, mistake. I believe that uh, uh, several things uh, uh, were, uh, came differently from what were organized today. <coughs> but um, that's uh, the um, uh, inconveniences of, uh, um, uh, of this uh, time. We all wish... Uh, all the best to our member, uh, Jumar Mendes, for his country. <coughs> and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.